Good morning, I'm John Raymer. Glad that you're with us here at Grace Point Church as we continue our series in the book of Romans. This morning, we'll be looking at Romans chapter 2, verses 12 through 29, the danger of spiritual style over substance. We all know what is true about us, but we hate to admit that we like to appear better than we are, uh, that our public persona doesn't always match uh, who we actually are and what we do. As parents, uh, any of us who've been parents for any length of time know that it, this is true. We tell our kids to do things that we may not in fact do ourselves. Do what I say, we say, and to ourselves we go, yeah, not what I don't do. There's an ethical gap between uh, appearance and actuality of who we are. And, and this is very common. Uh, it's been common to humanity from the very beginning. Uh, we've got some recent examples uh, in the news. An unnamed Michigan governor who uh, told everyone to stay at home in Michigan and not go to their vacation homes up north uh, last weekend had a graduation party uh, for her daughter uh, with over 100 people there violating all her own orders. And it also got released that uh, her husband had filled out a form to put her boat in the his boat in the water early and wrote on the top, I'm the husband of the governor. Do what I say, not what I do. If you've lived in the Chicago land, you know there's a very well uh, known pastor who a few years ago had it exposed that he had a very expensive gambling habit in Las Vegas. Uh, not only that, he misused church funds quite badly in addition to the gambling. He was later fired, uh, never really repented uh, of what he did. It brings dishonor uh, to the name of Christ. When a pastor is misusing church funds, but then exhorting his congregation and workaday people uh, to give generously. We think of the tragic situation of uh, church officials who know that they have had pedophile priests working in their parish, but instead of confronting this person and criminally prosecuting them you know, as they should, they just move them from parish to parish. The same pedophile hellish behavior inflicted on more innocent children. It happened hundreds, if not thousands of times, not just in the United States, but around the world. Or I think of a certain Hollywood elite uh, named after one of the great Renaissance uh, painters who flies around in his Lear jet, lecturing everyone else on leaving a smaller carbon footprint. The hypocrisy is nothing new, is it? Politicians, religious figures, celebrities. In fact, one of Jesus' strongest points of contention with religious leaders in his day was the gap between what they presented in public and who they actually are. But can we be honest about ourselves? I know I want to be thought of better than I really am. Don't we all get embarrassed when we get exposed as not matching up uh, to what we say? It's hard to admit, isn't it? But more than just talk about carbon emission or political games or misuse of money is a far more dangerous spiritual gap of what we say we are religiously and who we actually are before God. There's far more consequences when a person is confident about religious style points rather than the substance of their heart before God. In fact, our passage today, it, it's a tough one because it confronts this religious hypocrisy that is so prevalent, so prevalent among uh, many, uh, if not all of us in some ways. Paul says that it's not only a danger uh, to put confidence in spiritual style points, uh, it puts you in danger of the judgment of God eternally. So we're going to move, as we continue to move through Paul's letter uh, to the Church of Rome, let me just remind you uh, where we are on the map. It's a 
long letter, a very careful argument. Paul, the persecutor who became a proclaimer, he proclaimed the gospel in chapter one, uh, kind of the main themes, and said that people need to be made right with God, and that happens through faith in Jesus Christ. Now, to be made right with God means that there's something wrong with us. So like a skilled doctor, starting in chapter 1, uh, verse 18, he has been laying out for us uh, what is wrong with us so we know the need uh, to get right. And he's been systematically uh, addressing, like a skilled physician does in a physical condition, our spiritual condition as the human race. He addresses three groups of people systematically. The first group that we saw several weeks back in chapter 1, 18 through 32, uh, those are the moral anarchists. Uh, those are the people that Paul describes as those, they know God exists, uh, but they just suppress that knowledge because they want to do what they want to do. And the list of behaviors is uh, fairly appalling. Uh, these are the people who are unapologetically singing Highway to Hell and uh, having a good time while they're doing it. But there will be terrible consequences on Judgment Day for those rebels. Then two weeks ago, we looked at those who are a step up, at least in outward behavior, in their mind, the moralists. Uh, chapter 2, 1 through 11. The moralists are people who know that God exists, and uh, they outwardly are doing better than the first group, uh, but in looking down on others, looking down on that first group, uh, that moral anarchy that really did describe not only first century Rome, but many people today and throughout history, they thought that by looking down on others, it made them right with God. I bring myself up a step by pushing out someone else uh, down one. But Paul is very clear that that, that does not work. Uh, God does not grade on a curve. Uh, being a moral anarchist, uh, moralist uh, does not make you uh, right with God at all. And now he's moved into the third group, which will be the subject of our study this morning. It's a complicated passage, but we'll work our way through it bit by bit. And, and these are the religious Jews of Paul's day. They were more moral than the first day and group and probably more moral than the moralists. And they thought they were better than the moralists, maybe not because they were more moral in their behavior, but because they were Jews. They said, we're special because we're Jews and we're moral Jews. So we're better off than the moralists and we're certainly way better than the moral anarchists. They thought that the external style points of being a Jew, part of the covenant people, part of having circumcision and the law is what made them right with God externals was their confidence. You say, well, what does that have to do with us? Well, it has a lot to do with us. It's exactly the same thing for many around the world who call themselves Christians today because, hey, I was baptized as a baby. I'm okay with God. Never living for God, and I've been to funerals where I've sadly heard a clergy proclaim that someone is in heaven fishing with God, golfing with God, Jesus is their buddy, this colloquial nonsense that the scripture does not teach because they were baptized as an infant. And these were people I knew who lived like moral anarchists. They had no interest in God. Or maybe they're the person who occasionally shows up at church. They show up at Christmas and Easter, they kick a few bucks in the offering, and they're pretty confident that because they're better than others, and they show up occasionally at church, uh, that they're okay with God, that style matters more than spiritual substance. Now, our passage today, it, it's, it reads complicated. It's easy to get lost looking at each of the trees and, and miss the forest. And it, it breaks down in four major points. And so uh, I'm gonna read, explain it, Read, explain it, read, explain it. We'll go through it that way. So our first part of the text in chapter 2, and I hope you have your Bibles open to follow along, are verses 12 and 13, which teaches that religious privilege does not determine eternal destiny. Let me read. For all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law. 
and all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. Now, this is the first time that Paul uses the phrase, the law, in Romans. We'll see it many more times as we continue in our study. And it's shorthand for the law of Moses. It's not all legal law. It's the law of revelation of God to Moses on Sinai found in the first five books uh, of the Bible, especially the last four of those five uh, from Exodus through Deuteronomy. All the covenant laws of who God is, it includes the Ten Commandments, but it has many other laws about how people were to relate to one another in a just and fair manner. Uh, those smaller laws, details, actually are the basis of English common law, which is the basis of American law. Much of civil law is actually traced back uh, to the Mosaic law, the principles, throughout the Western world, really. And Paul here, in those two verses, he's dividing the human race into two groups. Under the law, he says, that means Jews. Jews were under the law. Apart from the law means everyone else, the word he's used before, Gentiles. So if you're a Jew, you're under the law. You have received the Mosaic law. If you are not under the law, you're everybody else. You're a Gentile uh, by heritage and by birth. We could sort of make the equivalent today that there are two kinds of Americans. There are those who are under the church, uh, those who are born in the church, maybe raised in the church, maybe go to the church occasionally, and those who don't attend church at all. The categories uh, still apply. And both, you might have noticed, or if you look at your text, you'll see both are defined by one phrase, all have sinned, all who have sinned. So whether you're under the law or not under the law, you still sin uh, before God. And again, Paul is making this case from Romans 1.18 all the way through uh, the middle of chapter 3 that we need grace, but we don't know if we need grace until we know how wrong we are with God. And that's what sin is, that separation from God. We need to be made right. So to be made right, we need to know that we're wrong. And he's saying here in this division uh, that those who are without religious privilege, uh, not under the law, uh, they will be judged accordingly, not by the law, but they'll be judged fairly by not being under the law. And he'll explain that a little more. Uh, but we've already seen the moralists uh, fail because of self-condemnation. They don't even meet their own standards. And those who are under the law, Jews, those who are Christians who have been exposed to Bible teaching, uh, call themselves Christians, those raised in the church, those exposed to the church, they will be judged by what they hear. So that's the principle. It's fair judgment. But religious privilege alone does not determine eternal destiny. The privilege of hearing the Bible, and many people have great knowledge of the Bible, but they don't believe it. But that privilege, that knowledge, will not do them any good on Judgment Day. The knowledge of the Bible itself, Jew or Christian knowledge of the Scriptures, in and of itself means nothing unless you believe and you respond with your heart. But the point that Paul makes is all sin in these categories, all are accountable. But if you have more knowledge, you'll be held to an, a higher standard. You know more, you're more liable. The vital point, of course, all throughout scriptures is that we need to respond from the heart to what we know. It's not mere information. It's to be life transformation. To be justified, Paul says here, to be made right. To be justified is the opposite of condemnation. All of humanity is either justified, made right with God, or condemned under the wrath of God because they continue to rebel and resist him. There is no category, no other third category. You're either justified or you stand condemned by what you know. 
So now Paul digs into this a, a little bit deeper in verses 14 through 26. As we'll see throughout Romans, he will introduce something and then a little bit later explain it more and more. Verse 14. For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they're a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. On that day, when according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Jesus Christ. What he's saying here is that the least privileged will be judged by their own actions. Not by the law, but by their own actions. Now, it's a tight argument, and it's easy to get confused on what Paul's saying. Uh, let me clear away two things that he's not saying that I've heard taught or read that have taught that is that are just wrong. Uh, some people think this is saying that Gentiles have a good nature, uh, that there are good-natured pagans, uh, people who have enough virtue in themselves uh, to make themselves right with God. But that is clearly denied in the scriptures. We'll see in chapter 3, uh, in a few weeks when we get to chapter 3, verse 23, Paul says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are without excuse. There is all who have sinned. We're all separated. And secondly, this doesn't mean uh, for those who have not heard the law or those who have not heard the gospel that somehow they are going to live a good life thereby proving that they would have believed if they had heard. Uh, that is a fantasy and not taught in Scripture. What Paul is saying in this section is that unbelieving Gentiles, those who are not Jews, those who have never been to church, have, all have an inner sense of right and wrong in their conscience. Sometimes do the right thing, Paul says. Sometimes they don't. Now, not every unbeliever is a thief or a murderer or an adulterer. Uh, there are outward differences, uh, but none are consistent. Uh, none obey their inner conscience of what is right and wrong. Uh, but what they show uh, by this sense of morality and having this conscience speak to them, uh, that God has written on every human heart a moral sense of ought. Uh, there is a sense of right and wrong, the requirements of the law. And Paul here is not going to the Mosaic law. He's going all the way back to creation because man and woman, humanity was created in the image of God and being made in the image of God, we are spiritual, moral beings. There is a self-conscious moral will. Now we saw in chapter one that it's there, just as knowledge of God is there, if you continue to do evil and you continue to rebel, you'll, you'll suppress it and suppress it, and, and at some point you become amoral. People have been that way, groups have become that way, nations have become that way. But it's only by developing a moral callous on the heart by continuing to deny God's truth. And anthropologists have, have recognized that every civilization has this sense of morality. Uh, with very rare exceptions. There's a general moral code among stable cultures, not a band, band of marauders, but among stable cultures that pretty much align uh, with commandments 5 through 9 of the Old Testament, the Ten Commandments. What are those? If you don't know them, 5 through 9, uh, honor your parents, uh, don't murder, uh, don't commit adultery, steal, or lie. Honor your parents, don't murder, don't steal, uh, don't commit adultery, don't lie. Those are pretty common in all cultures. The first four commandments in the Ten Commandments are about worship. And every culture until modern times has always had some sense of God. There's some kind of worship, uh, distorted, misunderstood, but it's there. They understand their creatures in a created universe with the creator. And Paul points out that sometimes their thoughts, their conscience accuses them and excuses them. That moral sense is there, telling us what's wrong, 
And then what does he mean by excuse? It doesn't mean we're right, but it's that human propensity to self-justification. Well, I knew that was wrong, but eh, it's only human. And well, I'm not as bad as the other guy and I'm not as bad as my drunken father. So it's okay, I'm off the hook. I may have stolen a little bit, but I'm not a thief who's taken a million dollars, et cetera, et cetera. This clear sense of a moral code, uh, Paul says, is written in all of our hearts, all of humanity. But on Judgment Day, everything will be revealed clearly. Those who are banking on being good are going to find out they're not. Because we can fool one another with our outward appearance, our style, but the substance of who we are will be revealed, as it says in verse 16, that in Jesus Christ, who has perfect knowledge, you see, all will be opened up. You don't have to be judged by the Ten Commandments. You can be just by, judged by your own sense of ought, your own sense of what is right and wrong. Did you consistently obey that? No one ever has, and no one ever will. So that's the Gentile without the law. That's the American non-church-going person. And now he moves to the main focus here of verses 17 through 24. And this is the religious, self-confident person. But he points out they will not be saved. They will not be made right with God unless their heart is changed. He's destroying self-confidence in externals. So let's read starting in verse 17. But if you call yourself a Jew, now he's honing in on the religious Jews who are confident in externals, and rely on the law, and boast in God, and know his will, and approve what is excellent, because you are instructed from the law, and if you're sure yourself you are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of children, having in the law the abundance of knowledge, the embodiment of knowledge and truth, you then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? While you preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say one must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, dishonor God by breaking the law. For it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Now, there's a lot there, but let me get you to the essence of what it is. He starts there in verses 17 and 18 with the, the true privileges, and they are privileges of, of being a Jew, of, of having uh, the law of God, uh, having uh, God's uh, favor on the covenant people. It, it is a good thing. It, it's a wonderful thing that the Jewish people had that revelation of God. But the Jews in Paul's day and many today uh, have a confidence that just by being part of the covenant people, they're automatically right with God. In Paul's day, the Jewish Mishnah Sanhedrin proclaimed this, quote, all Israelites will have a share in the world to come. That is, just by being born as a Jew, you are in with God and in eternal life. These religious privileges of not only having the law, they were able to teach others as they did in 19 and verse 20. Paul uses those whole series of descriptions, which may seem odd to our ears. Those are actually quotes from the Old Testament about what the Jewish people were to do. They were to be a light to the Gentiles. And the Jewish nation and people did have a moral influence on the world. Uh, there were many Gentiles who in Jesus' day uh, were God-fearers. They worshipped in local uh, they worshipped in local assemblies uh, of Jews because they saw the moral goodness of Judaism, and that's where Paul went when he went around the world preaching the Roman world. He preached to Jews and God-fearers, Gentiles first, who had learned from that. So that was all good. It is a good thing that the Jews had the scriptures and could teach others about God and how to live. So at this point, the religiously self-confident Jew is thinking, yep, 
I'm on top and nobody else is with or with me. But then Paul turns the tables. Now you understand, don't forget, Paul is a Jew. He describes himself in Philippians 3 as the, the Jew of Jews. He was a Pharisee. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews. Uh, nobody had style points on him. But he turns the table and he says, do you who teach obey the same thing? This question is repeated in Romans. It's repeated throughout the Old Testament. It's actually not a new question. And it's a question that Jesus pressed into the religious authorities of the day. You teach these things, but do you obey them? It's a question that every pastor is haunted by. Uh, I teach you, do I obey? Not as well as I wish I did. This question of style points. Do you have religious style points you're confident in, but perhaps lack substance? So now he turns up the heat on the hypocrisy after asking the question, and he gives three examples. The first two are super clear. Do you who teach against stealing, uh, that's the eighth commandment, do you also steal yourself? Maybe you're not robbing a bank, but do you work less than what you're being paid for? Uh, do you borrow from friends and family and forget to repay or return? Do you pocket little things that are not yours? Second, he says, do you who teach against adultery, the seventh commandment, do you commit adultery? Are you unfaithful in your marriage? Have you left your marriage for a better model, a newer model? a richer version of what you had before? Have you had affairs? If statistics are to believe, be believed in America, more Americans have had affairs than not had affairs. Jesus pressed it in even harder. He said, if you as a man, do you even look lustfully at another woman? You've committed adultery in your heart. There isn't a man in the world that can stand up under that accusation. And thirdly, he says, you who ab abhor idols, he's pressing in on the fourth command, do you rob temples? Uh, now some commentators just sort of throw up their hands. They don't understand what this means. And we can't be absolutely sure, but it's certainly a case of sacrilege, desecration uh, of worship. And I think Paul's throwing that in as the principle of not honoring in worship, not honoring God. It's kind of, he's coming around the corner to catch him uh, by surprise. Do you wholly disrespect God by not worship properly? Do you attend church and let others pay while you don't give? Do you desecrate God's name by taking his name in vain? Rabbi Joachim ben Zaki, who was a contemporary of Paul, bewailed in his day the increase among the Jewish people, he said, of murder, adultery, sexual vice, commercial and judicial corruption, and sectarian strife. They weren't quite as pretty as they thought they, looked, they were. So the principle is clear. Spiritual privilege means nothing if you have a bold inconsistency between what you say and what you approve of and what you do. Style instead of substance. Verse 24, uh, where he says that God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. That's a quote from both Isaiah and Ezekiel. That's nothing he made up. And that was true throughout Jewish history. The other nation says, well, who is this God? What kind of God is this? Look at the way his people, they're no different than we are, which is why God sent them in exile in Babylon because of their adultery to him, their idolatry, their gross immorality, burning their children uh, to idols in fires, oppressing the poor. Now, don't think this is just about the Jewish people. This applies to anyone who calls themselves a Christian. Now we're talking about religious people who has the privilege of hearing the Bible taught, 
Maybe they're a Sunday school teacher. Maybe they're a pastor. Or maybe it's me. We're part of worship. Uh, we can teach. But do we have an obedient and responsive heart to God? Is our heart soft to him? It's hard. It's a hard truth. Because anyone who is honest will admit there's inconsistency. But the question is, where is your confidence? You see, this is like Jesus' teaching in Luke 15, where he brought up the older brother. We all think of the prodigal, the parable son about the son, but it was actually about three people, two sons and a father. It's a parable of a whole family, and the prodigal son ran away. He was the obvious sinner, and he repented and came back. The older brother stayed at home, did everything that was right, but then he got mad at his father for showing grace to the younger son, and he showed that though he was closest to home, his heart was actually furthest from God. That's the danger of religious people. You know, religious people like this, they're the ones that the first three comments out of their mouth are always critical. They're quick to see what's wrong with other people, quick to see what's wrong with the pastor, quick to see what's wrong with the church, quick to see what's wrong with fellow Christians. They believe that their religiosity and their criticism of others is what makes them right with God. But the bottom line, Paul says, is this, is this is not only damning in your relationship to God. When you behave this way, when you call yourself a Christian, non-Christians look at you and go, what's the point? He's no different than I am. If this doesn't cause you to take a hard pause, I encourage you to take that pause. It, this passage should cause all of us who call ourselves Christ followers to do some real soul searching. Is our life an encouragement of others to come to Jesus? Or is our life so much like others that it actually is a discouragement to them? Is God honored by you, how you treat people at work and how you work and how you treat your family? How you handle your finances, what your moral life looks like? Or is it an affront to God and a negative example to others? You see, we're in a lot more trouble with God by our own efforts than we can imagine. These passages here, early passages, are designed to strip away human pride. Because until we know how wrong we are, we won't be desperate to be right with God. So this takes us to our last section, verses 25 through 29. For circumcision indeed is of value if you obey the law. But if you break the law, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. So if a man who is uncircumcised keeps the precepts of the law, will not his circumcision be regarded as circumcision? Then he who is physically uncircumcised but keeps the law will condemn you. And you who have the written code in the circumcision but break the law. For no one is a Jew who is one merely outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical. But a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart, by the Spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from God, from man, uh, but from God. You see, Paul is saying here that only a heart changed by the Holy Spirit is what makes you one of God's people. Spiritual style points don't count. Spiritual heritage don't count. Being born in the church doesn't count. Being baptized as a baby won't make you a Christian. It may be an act of faith by your parents, but you have to follow God. So he picks up on circumcision here because to the Jews, that is what separated them. 
uh, it started with Abraham. God had Abraham circumcise himself and his sons and all Jews after that, all Jewish males. It was a sign of God's covenant. So he's using the phrase circumcision here as a shorthand for being a Jew and having the law. For spiritual privilege with God, Paul says to be a Jew is better than being a Gentile. Why? Because you do have a head start. You have the law. You have knowledge of who God is. You have knowledge of how you should live. Uh, just like you have an advantage if you came from a Christian home. If you were raised in the church, even if you've a church, occasionally you've gone. Anything you have there is an advantage to you. But, verse 25, there's only value to it if you respond to it. He says there's no value to circumcision if you don't obey the law. That is, it's pointless. All these external things mean nothing if there's not a response from the heart. If you're from a church background or go to church, but you don't live by the obedience of faith, the scriptures say here, it, 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 you're actually worse than an unbeliever because you have more knowledge and you're more accountable. Now the response should not be, well, I won't go to church, so I'm not accountable. That's doubling down on a bad move. Circumcision, Paul is saying, it's not a magic charm. One rabbi wrote in Paul's day, quote, circumcised men do not descend into Gehenna, that is hell. See what he's saying there? If you're a Jew and you're circumcised, you automatically go to heaven. It's much like what some people teach today uh, in certain Christian churches about infant baptism. Uh, as long as you're baptized as an infant, you're in. Not true. Not taught in scripture. Clearly refuted right here in this passage. Externals do not give us assurance. This wedding ring I have does not make me married. It is a sign of being married. The person who starts with no spiritual privilege, Paul says, but has the obedience of faith, not only are they better off, he says, but they will judge those who have all these spiritual privileges but don't respond. Uh, Jesus said the same thing in a different way in Matthew chapter 12. He said at the last judgment, he was talking to Israelites who wouldn't believe in him. He said on judgment day, the queen of Sheba will arise and the penitence of Nineveh. Nineveh was the capital city of Assyria, and the prophet Jonah reluctantly was sent by God to preach to them. The Assyrians were, by any definition, the most brutal, horrible people on the face of the earth. Almost today, without equal. And yet the entire city repented. Jesus said, they will condemn the Jews of my generation of his day, because they responded and you have not. Paul is saying here that those without spiritual privilege who have responded to God, they will judge those. They have advantage over those who have all the spiritual advantages but do nothing with it. It's a great shock uh, to the Jews who read that and any Jew who reads Romans for the first time because to the Jew, being a Jew is everything. And Paul says, I've got all those external markers too but it means nothing because a true Jew is a Jew spiritually. According to scriptures, I, I, am, I am physically of German and English and Irish and little scribbles of this and that descent. But according to the scriptures, because of my faith in Jesus Christ, I am a true Jew. Genuine spirituality comes from the inside, not from the outside. Being a Jew makes you no more right with God. Being baptized as an infant or attending church occasionally or coming from a Christian home without response makes you no more right with God than taking a chicken, putting it in a garage, makes it a Rolls Royce. It doesn't change a thing. 
Three times he says in verses 25, 26, 27, observe the law. And he doesn't mean sinless perfection, but he's saying the heart response to the commands of God. He's using the phrase that matters most to believing Jews then. Because obedience, go back to chapter 1, verse 5, obedience is of faith. No one has perfectly obeyed the law except Jesus Christ. But all those who believe in Jesus Christ, who have genuine faith, will want to obey God's commands. How does that happen? Uh, how can that happen? Well, verse 29, it's the work of the Holy Spirit in our heart because our hearts are naturally hard and resistant to God. We need the Holy Spirit to make our hearts soft, to take our stubbornness and turn it into willful obedience, not disobedience soft hearts instead of hard hearts. In fact, in the book of Jeremiah, it mixes metaphors and calls out the hard-hearted Israelites of that day to circumcise their hard hearts. See, Paul isn't teaching anything new that isn't there in the scriptures of the Old Testament. Only the Holy Spirit can turn our vain pride away from being confident in religious eternal, externals to a genuine faith in Jesus Christ. Paul has slammed the door on religious self-confidence. He slammed the door on religious upbringing. He slammed the door on religious rituals making you right with God. The Bible insists that only those with surrendered hearts to God can be right with God. It's not salvation by obedience. It's obedience as evidence of salvation. If there's no fruit on the tree, the tree's not alive. You see, no matter who you are, no matter how good you think you are as a moralist, by religious externals, you'll never be good enough. Because God doesn't save by brownie points of ours. We don't ever have enough brownie points. He saves by those who humble themselves and say, my only hope is Jesus Christ. So I want to ask you, friends, this morning, what does your heart look like? When God looks at your heart this morning, what does he see? If you're not a genuine believer in Jesus Christ, you can make that decision right now. Lord, I surrender my rebellion and I turn my life over to you. Holy Spirit, please come in me because I believe Jesus died for me. He lived the life I couldn't live. He paid the penalty I deserved. He died for me and rose from the dead so that I can have life. You can have forgiveness be made right with God and have the gift of eternal life, the love you've always looked for, you can have it through faith in Jesus. And for those of us who are, are Christians, and maybe we've been Christians for a long time, but maybe this is a time for us to take stock before God. Ask God to shine the Holy Spirit's light on our life. Perhaps there is an area or areas of our life where there's a significant gap between our spiritual style points and the reality. We need God to close the gap, and he'll do that by the Holy Spirit, but he does that as he responds to those who humble themselves before him. You see, our only confidence is in what Jesus Christ has done for us, but we must respond to his gospel. Let's pray. Father, Paul has stripped away all our possible self-confidences so that we will know that our only confidence can be in Jesus Christ. And I pray for those who are listening today who have never surrendered to Jesus that today would be the day they would cross from judgment to life because all are either condemned or justified. And by trusting in you, admitting they're wrong, and have no confidence in themselves and believing in Jesus Christ, death and resurrection, all can be made right in a future guarantee. And Father, for those of us who are Christians, may you shine the light of the Holy Spirit on areas where we know there's a gap. And Lord, may we, in the obedience of faith, respond to you, but asking humbly for your Holy Spirit to change our hearts, to soften them, and to empower us to obey. Because on our own, Lord, we can't do it. We are dependent upon you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
God bless you. I'm so glad you were with us this morning. Uh, next week, we'll continue our study into Romans chapter 3.